Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am Mythmaster Bloodworth, and as you can see by the graphics, uh, today I'm going to be starting a new series of why you should play or run Mifrog, which is a mythic fantasy role-playing game. Um, and I'm going to go into a series breaking down the unique mechanics that I find in the special edition. So this is this is Mifrog 4.0, but the special edition where uh, even more is uh, is it's formatted differently, more streamlined, and some rule changes that make it really the best edition thus far, uh, rules mechanics wise uh, for Mifrog. Uh, so it's gone through a lot of iterations over the time frame and always. An improvement along the way so um, so I, I really do enjoy this game system uh, despite some of its you know the dark cloud that hovers around it game system wise it is a solid system now again there's been some hiccups along the way I was not a big fan of the lore of 3.0 in which I actually told the the author, um, you know, that fact that I, I thought it was kind of like a kitchen sink approach. Um, Mifrog 4.0 actually improves upon that, and it makes it more of a classic fantasy, um, Lord of the Rings esque type of theme to it uh, that the previous editions did not, you know, include. However. Lore-wise, and when I talk about lore, I'm talking about the world lore-wise of, uh, of Thule. I, uh, I still prefer 2.7. So that's why on the, uh, on the image that I'm using here, I'm showing you all of the components of, um, you know, of the game when I run it. And, and these are, I use 2.7 for the world lore, uh, which you can still find on... Uh, on um, Amazon, and I really do recommend that you pick it up uh, if you can. Uh, this is only $15 on Amazon. All right, and you can see this is a, a pretty hefty volume as well, and it's, um, it's a fully contained uh, tabletop role-playing game in here. You have your, your player portion, you have your Myth Master portion, and you have your... Um, your spells, your monsters, your, your deities, and and all kinds of uh, uh, world building stuff that is in here as well. Uh, and then I'm also I have the creatures of Thule Deluxe, which actually takes all of the monsters and everything out of here, puts them in here, and then attaches an image <coughs> to virtually every single one of them, if not every single one of them. And this is really a beautiful book uh, as far as layout and uh, and the art and whatnot that is in here so uh, I, I do recommend that you do pick this up even though the core rule books contains everything this just gives you a much better presentation for it as well as the lands uh, the land of Thule deluxe which includes all of the geographic and setting information that you could use uh, for uh, language and culture and, um, and and even pairs up the fantasy world uh, to uh, similar uh, or inspired by uh, true cultures in the real world. So you can uh, you can use those if you wish or or uh, you know reject them if you wish as well. You can make your uh, own setting. Uh, from start, you know, from scratch, if you wish to do so. Uh, so, what I wanted to do now is, uh, in this episode, I am going to talk about some of the unique mechanics in this. Now, one thing about Mifrog that uh, you may or may not know is that uh, it does not have a PDF form, uh, so you cannot get this in PDF. Um, that is a um, that is a publishing decision made, uh, and and it's not. Um, it's not unique. There are others that uh, choose not to publish PDFs. Uh, 
uh, Wizards of the Coast is one of them as well. So I'm going to switch views here and I'm just going to talk about a few of the key systems uh, for today, for this episode. I'm just going to pause this for a second. So as you can see here, uh, I have written in white down at the very bottom the um, the four areas that I'm actually going to go into a little bit of detail here now um, that I do think kind of stand out. It's, it's somewhat, uh, if not unique, uh, it is certainly something that uh, makes Mifrog even more playable uh, than some, some other uh, tabletop role-playing games that I have played in the past. So um, Hamin, Haminja, I, I, if I'm mispronouncing that, uh, I'm sure someone will come in and, and give me the proper pronunciation for it. When you generate your character, there are many factors to take into account and in Thule, the first thing you have to consider is how your Haminja will influence your character you create. The Haminja mechanics has been introduced to Mifrog to inspire players to do good and to cultivate a noble hero in themselves, both when they are, when they take the role of the character in Thule and hopefully also in real life. Uh, so... This is a this is a a a real step into saying that uh, the purpose of this role playing game is uh, for you to play your character heroically and uh, and as a a good person in general and and then to take some of those lessons into your own life outside of the game as well. So it really is encouraging uh, personal growth and such, which is which is really kind of ahead of its time if you look at some of the, um, you know, some of the other game systems that are out there that are starting to get into this concept of, um, you know, these are going to improve the player uh, in his or her own uh, interactions outside of the gaming. Uh, and and I've, I've spoken to this as well myself. Um, I do attribute... Uh, tabletop role-playing games in general to becoming a far better reader when I was in sixth grade uh, than I was before being introduced to gaming. Uh, I, I probably would not have been the, uh, the level of student that I became uh, later on in high school and in college and, and whatnot beyond uh, as a reader and as an avid reader if it wasn't for fantasy role-playing games and, and other role-playing games at the time as well. But let me continue. So, um, there is a Native European tradition aspect to it, as it is very much what our forebearers believe that your Haminja, which is really like an honor system, right, was linked to you and that it followed you through the ages. So, so it's, it's kind of connecting it to the... Um, um, it's connecting it to reincarnation and the belief that uh, reincarnation is a you know is an actual thing and it's it's you carry the um, the good deeds of your forebearers you know along with you. So um, it continues. That is what it means in the first place. Haminja from hammer. Jenja, um, to walk in shapes. You walk in, a di in different shapes, in different bodies, change your body when it dies, to be reincarnated to a new one. Your luck remains, your honor remains. And so again, it, in it encourages the players to run their characters in a very honorable way, um, which I think is a good thing. It, it kind of uh, it relates to uh, Gary Gygax's reasoning behind uh, making the alignment system very, very important to the process of role playing, uh, and and you gain these points. You start off in character creation with some of these points if you so choose to, and you can then spend them for some advantages uh, that. Um, that you know you can spend two points i believe you get a maximum of three points uh to start off with 
So you can gain two points to gain one extra character roll. You spend one point to gain a, one extra trained skill. Two points to gain a plus one modifier to one attribute. One point for extra language. <coughs> two points for an heirloom. One point to start with 2d6 ounces of silver. Two points to start with 5d6 ounces of silver. Three points, you start playing with a D, uh, 8d6 ounces of silver. One point, gain for extra talent. One point, if bard, ranger, or sorcerer, to know one extra weak spell. One point, spent, you can freely pick the character's race or species. One point, to modify the character's size by plus one or minus one if you wish to be smaller. The heirloom option, uh, you gain an item with a plus one or a plus two effect. All right, so, um, and, and effects like plus one or plus two uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's magic. It just means that it gives you the um, advantage of, of treating it like it's a either a plus one or a plus two to hit or a plus one or plus two to damage and um, and it's it's treated as if there are creatures that don't take damage from regular weapons this heirloom item would still do that um, although those are very very rare in uh, because magic items in general are fairly rare in Mifrog as well uh, so this would count as a low fantasy by the way uh, then there's bed uh, bed honor, I'll, I'll use that uh, for it, and there are uh, negatives for having a negative uh, Haminja. Now, when your character dies in this game system, there's a, uh, and if they died with a positive Haminja, the new character that your, that the player re -ro like rolls up uh, will carry that over. They will they will include that as part of their um, as part of their lineage of uh, of personal personage through their history as well. So even though they're a different body and a different uh, individual, they're um, they're considered to have that passed on to them when you're recreating a, a character after death. So really unique system. Uh, one again that encourages a certain type of gameplay that uh, that the author wants the players to really engage in, uh, but it also gives some negative consequences for those who don't, um, and and in some cases that might even be desirable too if you want to play that kind of like real outlaw, um, you know, chaotic evil kind of character. It's certainly possible to do so. Uh, next is the birth dates. So birth dates in here play another role uh, that's kind of unique to this game. Uh, and now this is is certainly unique in that um, if you're born during certain times of the year, certain seasons of the year, uh, you will gain a modifier, a plus one modifier to certain attributes. So that's a really interesting thing, you know, too, as well as if you share the birth date of a deity all right then you are considered marked uh which is a talent uh that gives you advantages as well so um so again another like fairly simple system but it really does tie you to the characters um you know to the purpose of the character's birth and everything it, it just uh, makes it important um i skipped over cultural backgrounds where you come from in the world, all right, uh, is also going to impact the skills that you start off with. And so here you have the lineage of your birth, your birthday, and your cultural background all uh, contributing to the character creation process. And, um, and, and that combination is going to... Um, not only flesh out your character, but it's going to give the character 
uh, a very unique feeling, you know, because there's there's very little chance of anyone's characters certainly matching these things up, especially if you're rolling randomly for your cultural background and your birthday. Um, you know, I, I think it's virtually impossible for anybody to have both the same birthday, same birth month, you know, and year and such all in one, uh, all in a series of roles. Then we get to finally the racial modifiers. Now, this is a game system that holds to the old school um, racial modifiers, and um, you know, and there there will be racial traits that um, that characters have. But they also use uh, the author also uses the term species here, um, and so race is considered the the within each of the species categories uh, and then species is a separate species right so uh, to give you an example of that you have you have categories of men right human beings and um, they have they have a, a, a differential between them you know whether it's high born mid born or low born uh, but there's there's not really the talk about um, racial differences in, in that aspect. There are cultural differences for sure. But um, you know, yes, you can be of a different race from a, uh, from a different culture completely from the world setting. Uh, so you can come from Egypt and you're an Egyptian, all right? And you will, you know, you will potentially be either uh, lowborn or midborn uh, for that social status that you're coming up with, um, chances are it will be very difficult for you to be highborn in that society because you're not uh, a native to those lands. But the other races or species, I should say, the other species are broken down into races, right? So you have um, you have dwarves who have different variants of dwarf broken down into it. So you have the dwarf and then you have what's called the dark elf, which is also a form of dwarf. Uh, that's the old, old school term for dwarves. Um, and gnomes are connected to the dwarf as a racial difference, even though they're considered to be in the same species. Uh, you have different types of elves. You have gray elves and high elves and wood elves. All right, so you have a species then broken down into three different racial qualities amongst them. Um, you have half elves that are kind of separate, but still within the still within the um, the species model of elves. And then you have halflings, which are other, right? They're separate from uh, all of the others. So you do have some species. Uh, modifications here and you have even further some racial modifications where there's a differential between uh, and I'll read two of them to you um, so a gray elf has uh, skill modifiers and these are all like plus one or at most plus two they have skill modifiers for acrobatics crafting uh, fortitude missile perception rune lore and stealth, mostly to perception, plus two to perception. Now I'll compare that to a high elf. A high elf has plus one to crafting, plus two to fortitude, all right, which is higher than a gray elf's, plus one to missile, plus one to perception, plus two to uh, rune lore, which is higher than a gray elf, and stealth. All right, so there, there are some variants to the uh, the different racial groups uh, within the species model, you know. Again, it's a it's a different um, it's a different way of treating the the different races and species differently, so that they do stand out. And there's a meaningful choice in selecting them, uh, and um, you know, and it's going to inform how you are running your character because you might have some different skill sets 
that uh, you know aren't available to you and you're going to focus more on doing those things. Uh, there's also attribute modifiers uh, as well and, and I know how you know uh, in modern you know D&D terms you know that's very taboo. It's like oh it's not it's not proper to give a dwarf a plus two constitution you know and an elf only gets a, a plus one or, or even a zero uh, modifier to constitution as if you know uh, all dwarves are, are you know um, have a higher constitution than elves. Those modifiers never work that way anyway. It doesn't mean that an elf can't have, you know, uh, a higher constitution than than this individual dwarf. There's, it's still the three d six, you know, um, attributes being rolled to begin with, and then modifiers are applied. There are no true minimums set here. Uh, but some attributes and some, you know, some uh, individual uh, types of characters do have minuses. But again, it still doesn't mean that they can't be above average across the board. Uh, so uh, it all really comes down to just tweaking these things a little bit to create some differentiation between uh, all of them. So again, combining all of this up, in the initial parts of character creation, you're starting to understand your character, <coughs> his or her lineage, and how that's impacting the character, their cultural background, and how that impacts the, the initial starting skills that they will have, their birth date, which ties into the, um, you know, into deities and into seasons and, and into those kinds of things that will, again, boost your attribute uh, scores, you know, for certain, for certain things, depending on what season you were born in. And uh, again, it, it makes you uh, think about your character. Well, I, I'm a child of the spring. And so maybe I'm going to build that into my character concept. And, and role play that out. And then finally, your, your choices of, uh, of species and then any racial types within those species, if you do have the option to choose those. And then once you have that core uh, setup of modifiers and, and beginning attributes, then you're gonna move into uh, the next series. And, and I will spend the video talking about that I am going to go into talents and flaws and roles. And roles is the, uh, is the term for uh, character classes, even though um, you'll start with a particular role and uh, as long as you, uh, you know, retain uh, the necessities of that role, uh, then you'll continue with that role. But you can pick up skills from other roles as long, you know, as you're going on, as you're going up through the experience level. So again, it's not as set in stone as um, as a true class system, you know, class and level type system here. So that will be the next video in this series. And then the following video, I will specifically talk about bards, sorcerers, and rangers because they are handled very differently here in some ways than they are in other game systems. And I think it does stand out as something that's fairly unique that, um, you know, should be spoken about. So this series of videos is by, you know, is by popular demand on my channel. Uh, a number of, of people have been going back to my older Mifrog videos and, you know, and showing an interest in those as well. And then some questions about uh, the game system itself. And, and I haven't done this kind of a deep dive and certainly not with that, um, with that uh, claim of why I think you should play or run this game system because it really is a, um, a much better game system than its political reputation would, would, 
would attach to it. And so I, uh, you know, I stand by it. I stand by this game system. And, uh, you know, I set aside any other, um, any other issues that anyone has about the game system based on its author rather than what the game system actually does. Um, now, I had mentioned previously that I was looking for a game system to convert uh, B2, the Keep on the Borderlands 2, and I'm already starting to map out what that would look like running the Keep on the Borderlands using the Mifrog system. And I think it's going to actually work extremely well, um, but I will be play testing that over, you know, quite some time and, uh, and eventually start talking much more about how that's been running uh, in the future. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you haven't subscribed already, uh, you know, please consider subscribing and hit that alert button so that you'll see the additional videos that I will be doing on this subject matter, as well as some others that were really requested. So I just recently picked up, uh, I just recently picked up and I'm going to reach behind me and grab it so I can show it off. Um, I recently picked up the Majestic Fantasy RPG and, um, you know, I'm actually playing in the author's game in uh, just a little over a week now. Um, so I will be playing in his, actually two weeks, I will be playing in his game in two weeks and I will be doing some follow-up videos on this as well. And uh, at the same time, I will continue doing the uh, Sumerian September a series of videos, although I'm probably not going to get around to doing one every single day. Uh, but I will be doing uh, Queen of the Black Coast next uh, for that series. And um, hopefully by Monday, I'll get into some shorter stories that take a little bit less time to actually read through or listen to and then create a video for that. Uh, so uh, it is Friday. So for those of you that are, you know, still at work or uh, already home from work and everything, I wish you all a great weekend. And uh, I should be running my Shadow Dark game tomorrow night at uh, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Really looking forward to getting the whole group back together again and, uh, and getting back on track with uh, running that campaign. And uh, we're up to session five or possibly six. Uh, we lost about three weeks time uh, due to vacation and other things that came up during the summertime. So I'm um, really looking forward to doing that. Uh, and then I'm going to miss the week of the 27th or the 28th because I will be at a convention, but I will be running Shadow Dark at that convention. So I will be doing a uh, convention recap probably Saturday night or early Sunday morning. Uh, after the convention to talk about that as well. So uh, again, if you subscribe and you hit the alert buttons, you will get notifications of all of these videos dropping uh, over the next two weeks. And I always look forward to your comments in the comments section. I try to respond to as many as I can, uh, whether it just be in commenting back at you or actually creating a video to address the questions or, or the requests that you have made. And, um, you know, as always, I look forward to seeing you on a gaming screen or at a convention sometime soon. You all have a great rest of your day. Take care.